So for daring to air his strong opinions and take to task the national pastime of dumbing down the American literary heritage, for having the audacity to step on the vanity of some of his colleagues while remaining true to his ironclad artistic integrity, Kleinzoller has been labeled the bad boy of American poetry <laughs> and the pugilist poet. His work assessed reductively by some of his detractors as crude ticks of macho preening that he is nothing more than a colloquial chronicler of losers, dive bars, and old girlfriends. <laughs> well, too bad for these folks. They're too intent on solving their own bruised egos to acknowledge that August Kleinzoller is, yes, a poet whose subject matter is robustly, unabashedly idiomatic and informal but in service to a technically vigorous, acutely intentional art that responds on a deep level to the varied artists who have shaped his broadly learned imagination. <laughs> William Carlos Williams and Thelonious Monk and Pound and Howlin' Wolf, the poets of the Tang Dynasty and Basil, Basil Bunting and Bartok. The contrapuntal quality of his poetry has perhaps been best captured by the late British poet Tom Gunn, who said, the distinction of August Kleinzoller is that he has combined two opposed poetic modes. The first is the jokey improv <laughs> improvised speech we associate with O'Hara. The second, the condensed, considered lapidary style of let us say bunting. When Kleinzoller reconciles them, he creates something all his own and does so with an energy I find unequaled by other living poets. Please join me in welcoming August Kleinzoller. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> On Johnny's time. When Johnny goes out, he's careful what gets into his time. He likes time plain. The better to taste it run out of him, like water out holes in the old town's corroded pipe. What sort of business are you in? The good burger always asks John. Monkey business is what John likes to tell him and won't crack a smile ever. That's John. But when Johnny goes out on Johnny's own time, he's out there doing the only one thing. He's burning off all the stillborn Johnnies that hatched in his head in the night. And that John, he won't ever come home. Not until he's right. Actually, I didn't, I didn't think this when I was putting this together, but uh, Kate uh, uh, and I worked together um, uh, 20 years ago um, and uh, uh, when I had a Lila Wallace and they hooked me up with a, um, a homeless veterans uh, organization downtown and uh, I'd visit them and uh, get them to write a bit. And, um, uh, one of the fellows was named Green, and Green told me this harrowing story, which might be true, it might not be true, but it's the hell of his tale. Green sees things in waves. Green first thing each day sees waves. The chair, armoire, overhead fixtures, you name it, waves. Which? you might say, things really are. But Green just lies there a while, breathing long, slow breaths in and out through his mouth, like he was maybe seasick. Until in an hour or so, the waves simmer down and then the trails and colors off of things, that all quiets down as well, and Green starts to think of washing up, breakfast even, with everything still moving around colors, trails, and sounds from the street and plumbing next door, vibrating. You wrote that you were the third of three children and you came so late that your mother decided to let the dog raise you. That's correct, yes. Yeah, and uh, your sister lived in the attic. Yes. Learning Latin mm -hmm. and your brother was out like falling out of trees, and he was smart, and great, and athletic, and fun, and 
your hero. And um, when you were seven or eight years old, he called you obnoxious. And you wrote, that was the moment I resolved to become a man of letters. <laughs> so I want to know, were you aware at that point um, that there was some kind of magnetic pull happening for you toward books, toward words, toward the life of the mind? And in particular, what was it about that word obnoxious that really stuck in your crawl? Uh, well, I, um, I, didn't, I didn't know what it was, but, but it, um, which got my attention. I, 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 I knew it wasn't something good, and um, uh, I wanted to find out what it was. But, it, but I was also impressed that if, if a, a fancy word could do so much damage, I, I, wanted, I wanted that uh, kind of thing in my quiver going forth into the world. Uh, but it's, it, in answer to the earlier part of your question, um, my, my parents were readers and, and my brother and sister were readers. Um, t uh, you know, they, during most of their gr growing up, television didn't exist. So by the time we got a, a TV in probably 1954 or so, um, I was the only one who watched it, and the family thought I was mildly retarded on account of it. <laughs> um, but the, it, it was a reading family, and uh, uh, that made a large difference. Uh, you know, reading was a good thing to do, and, and um, um, speaking um, properly, I, I think partly because my parents were both first-generation Americans, and. Uh, their parents had accents and, and limited English. Um, it was important for them to uh, speak well. And um, uh, they were horrified both by my New Jersey accent and my vile mouth. But um, that's another story. <laughs> so do you remember them? I mean, obviously, from the, the way you read your poetry aloud, and also I know that you are hearing, when, you're, when you write poetry, you're, you're thinking about how the words sound aloud, and I assume you're probably speaking it aloud as you're working on it. Do you remember your parents reading aloud to you? Where, did you have a sense of the life of words beyond the page? Well, my parents uh, read to me, as um, most parents, uh, or, or many parents, if, if, well, at least those who have the time, an inclination read to their children. Um, um, no, nothing out of the ordinary. I, I, what was out of the ordinary is, is, you know, they read at night as opposed to watching television, um, as did my brother and sister. Um, uh, in terms of uh, composing, I, I don't compose aloud, I, I, um, but uh, I do hear it in my mind. Uh, uh, both the uh, um, the rhythm and the texture of, uh, and the duration of, of uh, uh, syllables and uh, words, and so then I do roll it over. Uh, um, that was very much impressed into me uh, in my early twenties when I was a student of, of Basil Bunting, um, who uh, emphasized that, that way of composition. 